just want to express my thanks to you. Uh, we've seen you coming faithfully every meeting, some of you, and, um, and we just want to give you thanks for that because uh, um, it really makes it worthwhile. It's great. It's really been an awesome experience for us to get to know you. Um, some of the conversations I've been a part of up front here f with the ministry teams have just been amazing to see people uh, becoming honest and transparent um, and beginning to make that those first steps towards healing. And, uh, and so we just want to affirm you in that and say anything we can do as a local community of faith here to continue that journey with you and to assist you, please don't hesitate to call on us. Uh, I've got a little office here, and if you need to meet with me at some point, just give the office a ring and, uh, and set up an appointment with me, and I'm happy to meet with you, listen to you, pray with you, and, and that kind of thing. Another reminder, of course, that uh, being our last uh, evening, you've got only tonight to uh, put your name down if you want a set of DVDs at the back there. There's a pen and a piece of paper. And, of course, last opportunity in person at least to catch up with Wendy up front here and, uh, and give your name. And if you want to be a part of that 14-week journey, those uh, groups, those recovery groups. So at this point, we want to ask um, Cherie to come up. And I want to ask Wendy to come up as well. And uh, we just want to say a big thank you to you, Cherie. Being our last night would be amiss to, uh, to not just acknowledge the fact that you are sacrificed, sacrificing time away from home, that you're in a foreign and strange country, that you're a bunch of weird people, and, uh, and, and we just, we've been really blessed to have you with us, sharing thank your you. wisdom and your life story, and so we just want to say a big thank you. Thank you. Did I, um, thank you. Do I have this mic on? Is it on? Okay, good. <laughs> I'm sure he has passed the seed. Uh, we can't put it into words. The way the Spirit's working, working through you. And as I said to you, it was really nice to connect with you again last Thursday. And it's like I, I met you again, but it's like I was reintroduced to the Holy Spirit. And I think that's incredible. Oh. Um, Thank you. But today we're doing a little something else because as Little Birdie said you're having a birthday soon. Oh. So we've been up to a little bit of hijinks. And we have a, <laughs> have a gift for you. Instead of, a, of this being about your ministry, it's about oh. you. Uh, it's a painting done by one of our local ladies, Marnie no Ford, way. and it's a local painting, it's the Whangarei Heads, and there's a birthday card that everybody here is circulating and signing tonight. That is beautiful. Wow. Isn't it stunning? That is stunning. So is this where you showed me, that same mountain range? Yes, when we were driving oh. up and we were looking at the Whangarei Heads, we were looking across at this range of yeah. mountains, and they look very different on this angle. Um, it's beautiful. That's, that's the heads. It is really beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Can I give this to you and put it back in there? Okay. Thank you. And thank you for the birthday card. Yes. How fun. Yes. Okay. And should I step back down or do you have a question? I, uh, <laughs> yeah. Good question. Yeah. Um, I had a very interesting question come to me last night that, yeah. uh, that you would probably be a great person to answer this. Um, one of the people I was talking with asked this question. They said to me, you know, does the pain ever go away? They, they, they were, they were um, grieving, if you like. Uh, some difficult things have happened. And um, just this question, I suppose there's different types of pain for different types of situations. But, but in a nutshell, how would you answer that? Does the pain ever, do we ever come to a place where there's no more pain? Somebody told me one time what was really interesting is they said someday you're going to look back on all of this and you're going to not want to change a, 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 a story or a moment or a thing. And I thought, oh, shut up. There's no way. What do you mean? And I thought, I thought what they said was absolutely crazy. I would change everything. But I, you know what? Today, I wouldn't change a thing. And so there are times that I have to experience the pain. There are sometimes it's triggered. Um, uh, but most of the time, I have a great life. My recovery is very real and very substantial. So I think that I have a lot of joy. I'll feel it sometimes. I'm not afraid to be sad anymore. I used to be, think that that was horrible. Uh, if I have to cry about something, I'll have a good cry and then get on with things. But I would say that most of the time, um, my recovery is so real and the pain has been processed that I don't have to live there. Uh, but don't be afraid of your pain because some of you are going to have to deal with Hey, hi. Some of you are going to have to deal with that um, um, stuff coming up right now. Um, don't be afraid of it. Um, it's going to hurt. You are going to cry. You're going to have to process. Sometimes our pain is very deep. Losses are very painful. Um, but if to the level that I don't allow myself to feel pain, I also won't feel joy. 
Do you know what I mean? So one thing, I'm not going to be able to say, you know, I don't want to, I, I want to cut my heart off and not feel this. But know when you do that, you really don't laugh as hard, um, all that kind of stuff. And so part of healing is to um, experience that. But I, I, you know, I have mostly in my life laughter and joy and, you know, I get to um, experience that kind of stuff. Awesome. Good. Before you speak, All let's right. pray. All right. Father in heaven, we thank you again for everything that you've been doing. We thank you again that Cherie is with us at least for one more night. We thank you, Lord, that you have a whole ministry planned for her over the next two weeks in New Zealand here, blessing other people in other places. And we pray that uh, not only that you would bless us tonight one more time, but that you would bless her as she goes on from here. Everything from, from traveling mercies and safety to uh, connecting with the people who you ordain that she should connect with in these other places, to uh, giving her strength and stamina and wisdom and, uh, and grace as she speaks and addresses those other people in other places. And uh, so one more time, Lord, right here tonight, look upon us, surround us with your presence, and uh, give to us your Holy Spirit in a way that we will hear and feel and sense that you are real and that we are in your hands. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to say, um, first, forgive me. I didn't have time to get changed or uh, properly get ready for tonight. And so um, I thought about it. You know, can I just le come later? And, and, and you guys just forgive me for that. Um, but I'm just going to come as I am and say I am so glad to be here. Um, so I wanted to say that we're going to talk about um, some, um, um, I think, one of the most important things in recovery, but let me get um, this program set up so I don't have to think about it again. Um, and when I got this, I literally got everything. And so, so I would, let me kind of cancel this, um, delete that. I'm gonna get back to the first screen here and put that up there. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, healing um, in, in such an incredible way. Because remember I said that if we start to heal and we decide we're going to do it on our own, it's like putting a little sandbag when you're looking at a tsunami coming at you. And it won't work. There's no way to do this on your own. There's no way um, to really kind of be prepared for the amount of work you have to do if you're not starting to connect with each other and definitely connect with God. Every 12-step program on the planet, and I'm not even, so I'm just using reference as a 12-step because people are more aware of that, but every 12-step program from 1935 on says the first step is what? We're powerless and we need help. First step, I gotta say that. Because if I don't see how twisted I am, I'm never going to grab hold of the help that I need. And so we have to break denial, you know? And for a lot of us, it's really tough to do. Because especially if we have mask on or if we've learned how to um, kind of step away from um, the reality of who I am. Um, and, but the first step is I'm powerless. The second step is there is a God that can restore me to sanity. So we're going to look at all of that kind of stuff today. And then there's a lot of other steps. There's a lot of other work. But the first couple things. First, you've got to know that you've got a problem. And second, you've got to know that there's an answer. Um, I'm going to, uh, for some of you that haven't um, heard this story, I'm going to um, tell you a story to start this out with, is um, I prayed like crazy. Like I wanted to do, I wanted to work with addicts. Some people don't like working with addicts or people that are damaged. I love you guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? I love addicts. And, and, but I don't have a lot of time for silliness. Like an addict will tell me like, um, like there's a guy I met. And um, he's doing recovery, and he's first part of his recovery, and 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 um, um, and he goes in the store, and he's deciding, like, you know, I'm like, I'm gonna eat better. It'll help me in my recovery, and it will, you know. So he's walking down the aisles and stuff, and he walks down the cereal aisle, and he sees like cocoa puffs. <laughs> I'm gonna get some. Cocoa Puffs or whatever. They're horrible for you or Fruit Loops or whatever. I don't know if you guys have those, but they're those sugar-coated cereals. And he grabs a box and he's walking and he says, oh, wait, 
I was going to do healthier things. So he, he sees some peanut butter and he says, I'll just, instead of having this, this cereal that's just sugar, loaded with sugar, I'll get some peanut butter. And so he puts the, the cereal next to the peanut butter and he walks away with the peanut butter. And then his conscience says, is that where the cereal goes? And he's like, oh, stop. You know, last week he could rob you, and this week he can't put the cereal on the wrong shelf. He's like, this is not fun, you know? And so he just tried to ignore that, and he kept walking, kept walking. And finally, it just, he couldn't stop thinking about it. That's not where he found the cereal. Go back and put it on the right shelf. And so now he's mad. He walks, grabs the cereal, <laughs> takes it to the shelf, puts it on the right shelf. And, 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 um, so in our recovery, it's amazing to me that we literally start to get led. Um, we start to look at the fact that um, some of us can put the box on the wrong shelf, but some of us can rob you. Some of us can sleep with your spouse. Some of us can do all that kind of stuff. And so there is that sense in recovery that we start having to look at these things. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty huge thing. So, uh, so I'm in recovery. I'm praying um, for all kinds of stuff. I'm praying for, um, I, you know, I want to work with addicts. I want to do that kind of stuff. Um, I'm, I'm really, um, I, I, I love being able to look at somebody and say, don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to yourself. Are you happy right now? You know? And, and, and so I'm, I'm, I, I like to even confront crazy behavior because I know that if you get it, you're going to walk away healthier. So, I, you know, I'm doing all that kind of stuff and praying. And, and, and one thing leads to, leads to another. I couldn't get anyone to hire me in their ministry, but I started my own nonprofit. Um, it's international now. We're doing incredible stuff. It's very fun. And I, I went to work... Um, um, with an, a number of different organizations. But one of the, the times I'm at the airport and I'm coming home from doing um, a gig and I'm, I'm waiting for my luggage, and my pastor who I love, this guy named Randy Maxwell, he's amazing, he's at another um, um, area in the airport and he's waiting for his luggage. He just came home. And he looks up at me and he says, Cherie, aren't you a heroin addict? And I'm thinking, wait, I was. <laughs> and I'm thinking, did you just yell that across the airport? Now everybody's looking at me and they're kind of protecting their luggage, you know. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, stop. So he comes over. And it, does anybody have my computer bag? Is it up here? Did you take it back there, Bill? <laughs> Get the book that's in the, um, right in the computer bag. So anyhow, so he comes up and he says, um, you know, I just got back from this place called Willimantic, Connecticut. And 60 Minutes, which is a, a news station uh, in the U.S., 60 Minutes just did a special on Willimantic, and it's called Heroin Town, the most highly trafficked place in heroin in the United States. I mean, it's huge. It, and it's a little tiny New England town. It's like as beautiful as this place is, but because of the way the harbor is, they can bring drugs in and out of that, and it's just, it is, it is just the worst place for um, heroin. So he said, I just got back, and I was doing a thing on prayer, because he does prayer conferences. He wrote a book called If My People Would Pray. I mean, it's what he's, his passion is, is prayer. And he said, I'm, I'm talking to a group, and I said, you know what? And he's telling all these incredible prayer stories, and one woman in the back says, heck with praying for Columbia. Pray for us. <laughs> He said he was stunned because he didn't know what to say. Because he's saying all, well, how God has answered the prayer of trafficking in, the, in, in, um, in South America and all that kind of stuff. And so he tries to not respond, but his heart responds, right? He meets with the pastoral team afterwards. They pray. They realize that there's a huge problem in this town. And he said, let's just pray about that. Let's just cover that. Let's just see what God has in mind. And so then he comes back home, and I'm standing at the airport. And he says, man, aren't you a heroin addict? And, I, and so I'm like, you know, Randy. And so he has this book in his hand. In his hand. So it was a book that he wrote the foreword to. Uh, I wrote Miracle from the Street, My Own Story. Randy wrote the foreword to, and he says, um, what if we could take and, and bring you in as a speaker and some other people in as a speaker and start going into this town and see if we can make a difference. And then on the cover, 
not this particular cover, but on the newer cover. This cover, it looks like Ken and Barbie doing drugs, but um, in the real cover, on the later cover, there's a photo of a guy named Marco that's doing some lines of coke that's actually just make-believe lines of coke. We don't give lines of coke to all our models, but it, <laughs> so he's, you know, so it's got Marco and some people doing some lines of coke, and it's got some bikers that, you know, killed a 13-year-old girl. So the cover on the new one is pretty intense, but this is the one I had in my hand that day. And we're looking at that, and I said, you know, man, if you could have me come in, that would be nice. But how about um, have Marco come in? And Marco is a hardcore methamphetamine addict. He was just so trashed. And some young girls from camp meeting decided that they were going to go do ministry in the park. And I don't know what pastor said, let's go ministry in this park. Well, it's everybody selling methamphetamine. I mean, this was a hardcore park with a lot of drug addicts. And these kids come in, and they bring the guitar out, and they're singing, Jesus loves you, this I know. And Marco comes up and says, I'm trying to sell drugs here. You know what I mean? You really are kind of messing business. Nobody wants to come. Um, why don't you guys finish up this song and, and, and just go back to camp meeting? And so this young girl says, um, but we came to teach you about Jesus. <laughs> And she's like shaken, and he's strung out. He is skinny as, he's angry, he's got, you know, he's got his, you know, his business, and, and, and he's been on the streets for I don't know how long at that time, but he looks trash. He's just trash. Teeth are rotted. I mean, he's just a mess. And, and he says, I know who Jesus is. Finish up the song, go back to camp meeting. And she says, you know who Jesus is? And he said, yeah, are, are you Seventh-day Adventist? And she said, yes. <laughs> and he said, me too. <laughs> and she's like, no, stop. And it blew her mind. She's like, her mind was blown. She's like, there's no way. She said, he said, are you at this camp meeting? Name the campground. My mom's probably there. She thinks I'm dead. I haven't seen her in years. But my mom's probably there. And she starts crying. Can I just tell your mom you're not dead? And he says, whatever. Just finish the song. Well, what if your mom wants to say something to you? Can I just have a number? I'll just call you and tell you something. And he gives her her cell number, his cell number. I mean, what drug addict does that? What dealer does that? Little 17-year-old girl with a guitar singing, Jesus loves you, and here's my cell number. So anyhow, so she goes back to camp meeting and finds his mom and said, I just saw Marco, and he looks really bad, but he's alive. And they talked and cried, and she called him. Your mom just wants you to know that she loves you. And um, she called him every Sabbath for the next year. Every Sabbath, next year, do you know that you're loved? She didn't say much, but the next year, Marco shows up at camp meeting. <laughs> So crazy, starts his recovery journey. It was not easy for him, but starts his recovery journey. A few years after that, he ends up at Andrews University, and now he is a pastor. So I said, let's take Marco. Do you know what I mean? Because you've got me and my recovery, you've got Marco and his recovery. And then there's a guy named Michael Harris. Does anybody know Michael? Michael is a heroin addict, but he's a vocalist. Um, um, he got in an accident while he was high. They flipped the car up. His wife got thrown out of the car um, and um, paralyzed for the rest of her life. And Michael, in his recovery, as he, he wasn't recovered at that point, of course, the, the um, accident, his wife now is in a wheelchair, and he was using, and he would tell her, I am sick of having to take care of you. And she would just ask to go to the bathroom or some water. And she can't get out of her chair. And he's an addict, and he was horrible. He was horrible. And um, finally, he repents, gets into recovery, and of course, really works through some stuff with her. But he was horrible. And I said, let's take Michael as vocalist. He's an incredible vocalist. And so, so we decided on the team. And all of us had different journeys, but we're all in recovery. And so we decided that we're going to go every three months to Willimantic, and we're going to... Um, um, See what we can do. You know, not even have any plans. We'll pray. We'll work with some addicts. We'll work with the folks there. So we, we go in, and we got a number of churches involved. Um, at, at one point, I was getting ready to go back to the airport, and it was winter. And in that part of the world, winter, they can have 35 feet of snow. 
I mean, things are buried. Airports are shut off. It's just crazy what happens weather-wise. But I'm getting ready to go to the airport, and um, I can't fly out because the airport is closed. So this uh, one Sunday-keeping church says, you know what, I know she's still in town. Can she come? Because it's Sunday. Can she come and do the service and then go to the airport? And we said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we get to this church, and I'm going to do the service. And, and we literally are going, they dropped every all the music, all the bulletin stuff, and they said, let's her speak first, because if the airport opens up, she has to go, and, and she won't be able to finish the, whatever she has to say, so let her speak first. So I went up, and, did, and, and it was so fun, because, man, I don't, I don't take notes on what we're going to talk about, so I don't, I don't have to say, you know, I don't have a sermon ready, you know, because I'm very seldom ever ready <laughs> for anything. But I think that, that, that um, God is. So anyhow, so I get up, and it was amazing, and we connected, and, 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 and afterwards, I'm getting ready to go, because now the airport's open, and I'm heading to the door. And I hear them making announcements. And the announcement was, it's getting close to Christmas, and we're going to do Christmas caroling through the town. And so... Um, um, you know, um, who's going to be involved, and raise your hand, you know, um, make sure you get a hold of so-and-so, and put your name down, and, and I heard that, and I said, are you going to Christmas Carol Hooker Hotel? Because Hooker Hotel is the hotel where all the drug addicts and hookers live, downtown Willimantic, and it's actually called Hooker Hotel. It, oh, the, and and I, I, like, I, it vexes me that it's called that. I've actually t contacted the mayor on one of my trips to try to change the name, but a Hooker Hotel, it was, um, the town was discovered by a guy named J.R. Hooker, and it's named after him. So I said, are you going to um, Carol Hooker Hotel? And they said, oh, no. <laughs> And I said, you know, if we're going to do this outreach, and if you seriously want people to know that we care, you can't bypass where these addicts are living, you know? And they said, but you don't understand. When we do the Christmas caroling, we say, God bless their business. <laughs> And we just can't do that. You know what I mean? It's like we can't do that. And I said, how about bless the recovery? Just change the prayer a bit. But you've got to do it. And they said, well, Sheree, we don't know. No, 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 no. So I have to get back to the airport. I get home. And, and I get an email a few days later, and they decided that they're going to go do the caroling at this hotel. And I was so proud of them. I can't even tell you, when you break all the stuff you think you know and you reach out to people that you just don't have any hope for, God actually does incredible stuff. So I'm just so proud of them. So um, they're going to go to Hooker Hotel and they're going to do the, the caroling. But somebody says, have you seen the hotel? It's like filthy. And so one of the women that has just got a, she's just brilliant and she's beautiful, she said, well, let's clean, let's get it clean first. Just the outside windows on the outside of the building. So they hire somebody and they clean the outside of this one building just as you go into the hotel lobby and they wash the windows. And then somebody says, you know, it looks really nice. Let's get someone to do a little Christmas, like a little painting on there, you know, like a poinsettia or some, some stuff on there. So they got some artists to do that. And then they said, oh, it looks so nice. And they put lights around the window on the outside. And then they said, but the lobby's terrible. This is terrible. So they go in and they clean the lobby. And then they don't have a tree, so we have to get a tree. And then they got some people to donate presents. And pretty soon, all of the addicts are coming out of the room, and they're sitting on the steps looking at the lobby, and they're trying to figure out who are these crazy people. And they're all strung out. These are, it looks like a Norman Rockwell painting, but gone wrong. You know what I mean? Like, but all they're, they're just like, who are you and what are you doing? And they're, they're heroin addicts and drug addicts and prostitutes. And, and so they clean up that. They get a tree. And uh, the mayor comes in not long ago, not long, long after that, and says, who are you guys? What are you doing? And she gave $50,000 to us to make a difference in the community with these addicts. I mean, it was amazing to watch one thing after another. But there was two, these two women, and they were like, I mean, I was a thousand years old. They were just, you know, um, the older women, incredible prayer uh, folks. But they decided that every day they were going to go to Hooker Hotel before the caroling and walk around the hotel and pray. Has anybody done that, prayed for like a prayer walk kind of thing? So they're going to do that every day, just walk around. And then there's a, a little um, brick wall in back of Hooker Hotel that the prostitutes kind of take their smoke breaks. 
You know, they'd go sit and talk and have a smoke. And so the women would get there really early. And they would say, God, bless any fanny that sits on this. this uh, do, do you guys think fanny just like Australia? Or is fanny bottom? Okay, good. So bless any, and bless any fanny that sits on this place. And they would pray for whoever takes their breaks there, whoever um, does that. And they're doing these prayer walks and they're doing all this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, stop, this is so crazy. But in the meantime, and some of you guys have heard this, is I went to the doctors and I went to do a, just a kind of a, a checkup. Um, and, and I do annual checkups because I'm normal now. You know, I do all those kind of legit things. You know, I get my blood work done. And, and he comes in with kind of tears in his eyes. And he says, Cherie, I don't get this. And I said, what? And he said, you have hepatitis A, B, and C. And I thought, oh, man. <laughs> And he said, how did that happen? <laughs> I'm like, you don't even want to know. Well, you know what I mean? It's like, I know exactly how it happened. I remember being 14, 15 years old in a hotel that was about $4 a night. The bathroom's down the hallway. I, we don't have needles. And we found a needle underneath a trash can that was used so much that we had to take sandpaper and sand off the tip of the needle in order for us to inject anything. So I said, you know what? I, I'm not telling them how it happened, but I'm not shocked, you know? I'm surprised that it happened that you get a diagnosis so long after you stop. Like I had not used for years. So why now, you know? And so I thought, you know, I said, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. And I didn't even feel sad. I mean, I should have everything. I should have AIDS. I should have hepatitis. I shouldn't even have my mind, you know? So I'm grateful for the recovery I have. And so he just says, you know what? This is intense, you know? And we're talking about, um, he has to do some more studies. They have to do a biopsy of the liver. They have to start in a few on treatments and some other stuff. And so we start to see each other on that. At one of my visits, he said, I'd like to test your husband. Wait, what do you mean my husband? I'd like to test your husband, because if you have it, more than likely he has it. And I was so sad, because the only sin my husband ever did really is loving me. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I don't want him to end up with hap C and liver cancers and stuff because he loved me. And so I just now feel sad about that. And then he says, I want to test your daughter. Wait. And he said, you know, you gave birth to her. So we got to test her. And I can't even tell you how sad that was. Getting the test on, waiting for the results, all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and so I ended up um, waiting and, and, and just grieving. Um, what if, what if, what if. But their test came back and they were clean totally clean. And for you that some people that have heard this story, just bear with me. Um, I'll get into the teaching from the story. But what happened at that point is I started to really look at, you know, I was afraid to, to, to let them kind of close to me in some areas, because if I do have this, I don't want to give it to you now. I mean, if you've been, you're still clean. And, and, and my husband kind of grieved um, with, you know, I, I don't know, it, it's, it's almost like when you love somebody, it's and you have to think about what is it going to be like to not be with them and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and I'm thinking, you know, stop, you know, and he's, he's um, um, you know, trying to tell me, you know, I, I don't want you to die. And I'm like, stop, we're going to be fine. And, and, and so I'm going back and forth and I end up at Willimantic again. I come back, we end up, we're going every three months. So I end up again there. And a number of churches decided that they were going to pray for me. And some of you, like I said, have heard this, but you, they're going to pray for me. And not only are they going to pray for me, but they're going to pray for me, this one church, until something happens. And I don't want prayer. I really didn't want prayer. I remember thinking that I really am okay. I don't, I don't need you to pray for me because I'm fine. No, no, no. We want to pray for you. And, and, I, and I really felt like I'm fine. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. And let's just pray for um, the people we're working with. Let's pray for the hotel. Let's pray for the project. No, no, no. We're praying for you. And I had such a fit. I was like, I don't want prayer. I don't want prayer. And, and, and I didn't say that out loud because I knew that was a bit crazy, right? So they said, no, get up here. And, and so I finally get up there, and I'm, <laughs> I'm walking like this. Go ahead. <laughs> you know? And inside, I am say, I'm threatening God almost. Like, God, 
You know I'm not asking for this. They may be praying for me, but I'm not asking for this. And I'm like having this argument with God inside, and I'm thinking, what's that about? And, and, and they're praying, and um, some people pray for five minutes, two minutes. Some people pray for days. <laughs> and, you know, I had a group um, that just prayed for days. They just would not. They went on and on and on and on. And I'm thinking, you know, let's just get on with things, you know. And they're st still praying. And so finally this woman says, um, if you don't want to pray for healing, what do you want to pray for? And I said, maybe my emotional stuff. Because sometimes I feel so stuck, you know. And so she said, okay. Started to pray for that stuff. And in that moment, I felt healing from the bottom of my feet all the way through my head. I mean, I just felt like it was the most amazing thing. And I was so mad. <laughs> I said, I didn't ask for that. I didn't ask for that. She asked for that. If you want to heal her, heal her. I didn't ask for that. And I felt, I felt agitated. I felt angry. I, I, I felt like, you know what? That's not fair. I didn't even want to tell anyone that I think I just got healed because they would say amen and I would have to hit them. I just thought, you know what? I don't want this. I, it's not amen to me. This is not something I'm asking for. Even getting home, I had to tell Brad, I think, you know, I, I got some healing. And Brad looked at me and said, well, let's just get some blood work, you know. Went to the doctor. I, I, I'd like to get some blood work. And he said, you know what, Sheree? you don't heal from this? And I said, tell God that, because I'm not happy about it myself, you know. And so he does a blood work finally. Um, yeah, um, the insurance won't pay for something that you don't need, and so we've got to um, deal with that. And he does a blood work. I wait for the results, not that day, but come back for the results, and um, I have nothing. Don't even say Amen. I'm not happy. This was not what I asked for. I, like, he's telling me that, and I am so angry. I'm so angry. Like, I didn't ask for that. What about the person that's asking for that? And I'm just angry. And so, you know, Brad is looking at me like, that is crazy, hon. And I think I know. But I don't know why it's so real. I'm, I'm not happy about this. And it's just like trying to figure that out. And I finally said to God, I said, you know, God, I know that this is crazy. This is crazy. And he said, Cherie, you have wanted to die every day of your life. You look at this as a way out. I'm going to ask you to choose to live. And I just started weeping. I don't want to. I don't want to. And I had no idea. The, the underlying thing that I walked with is you could have taken me out at any time. I would have said something stupid like, you know, I'm not afraid of death. Instead of saying, I welcome death. I don't want to be here. My next breath scares me. Um, you know what I mean? And so God said, I want you to choose to live. And um, it was a really interesting place to be, is to say that, um, how do I do that? Because I don't know. I, I've done a lot in recovery. But that part of my recovery, to choose to actually be here, was such a major step that I didn't even know how to do that. Um, uh, luckily, I think I heard a pastor say, as a day is a thousand years to God. So 24 hours um, for us is like a thousand years to God. And there's a number of places in the Bible that says that. So if you do the math, if a day is a thousand years and I live to be 80, how long am I actually here spiritually? And the math says I'm here about an hour and a half, right? So God says for an hour and a half, choose to live. Whatever hits you, Whatever you carry, whatever you have to deal with, for an hour and a half, for God's sake, choose to live. And I just wept. And when I chose to live, my whole life changed. So now I start looking at, what if the Bible's true? What if there is a God that knows that, me that intimately? What if he knows you that intimately? He knows not only what the, the, the behavioral stuff is, but what the bottom line is that drives all that kind of stuff, and he wants to bring healing there. So I'm, I'm thinking, okay, so I start to actually look at, you know, what is it that I need to know? It, um, is healing possible? You know, is it possible? I started to do a study on the Holy Spirit. 
What is the Spirit of God? Why did Christ say, don't do anything without this? I am actually going to go to send my Spirit to help you, to be with you, to guide you, um, literally to be, I think, our recovery partner. So I'm going to tell you a little bit. I'm laughing out loud on your own skin and the Holy Spirit. I never get this thing to work. So somebody can somebody um, um, kind of deal with this, and I'm going to um, continue on. You got it, Nigel? Thank you. So one of the things that um, it's really interesting, the first thing I learned is if I am praying for help with the Holy Spirit, if I'm praying for help from God, if I'm praying for recovery, if I'm praying for all of that kind of stuff, but I'm just praying for that because I want to pay my mortgage and I don't want to stress about bills anymore. Right? What do you think that gift is going to do for me? Is it going to benefit me in my recovery? It's not. So the measure that we need it, the measure that we're going to use or rely on God is a measure that we get it almost. Like if I'm only going to ask for the Holy Spirit because I don't want to get up and change the channel, I, I, I actually want like a remote. God says, you know what? The motive is actually going to hurt you. But if you are seriously saying, I'm, I want you to heal me. I want you to forgive me. I want you to bless me. He said, I will pour everything into you, and the Holy Spirit will come with all the other blessings in its wake. So it's like the, the, the measure that we ask for God depends on the use that we're going to make of it. And so remember that. You can't play God, you know, and, and raise your hand if you've tried. You know what I mean? We try. You know, we try to bargain with him. We try to pray, uh, play him. You know what? If you pay my, um, if you pay my electrical bill, I'll go to church. <laughs> you know, and, and I think God, um, he, he is gracious when we do those kind of things. But know that um, um, he doesn't get played that easily. So it's really, it really is um, when I come to him and actually in my heart of hearts. When the demoniac was healed in the Bible, there was a guy crazy, cutting on himself, living in cemeteries, naked. He was a guy that probably beat and molested folks. Um, when God responded to him, he said um, that because of what was in your heart and the, what was in this guy's heart is please don't leave me like this please help me and that's a heart cry that God will never ignore so um, if you're going to play him he won't I don't think he will respond in the same way but if you literally give him any kind of real stuff um, his healing ability and the Holy Spirit is just amazing. So know that um, there's um, a couple things that you got to know is that, that when we come to God with our hearts, um, Jeremiah says, when you come to me with your whole heart, I'll change everything. You know, it's like it's huge, 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 huge. There's two works of the Holy Spirit. One is to lead us. Um, literally to woo us and to lead us into relationship. And that's a huge, incredible thing when somebody says, you know what, I think God has kind of been with me my whole life. That's the Holy Spirit, and that is what God does. The next thing is, is to fill us up. There's something that happens when I realize that I'm not only being wooed, because I'm going to respond to that. I literally am going to respond to the loving um, care of God. But there's a time that I literally look up and say, man, fill me up. Do you know what I mean? It's a different stance even. It's, like, it's, just, it's a, where I realize my need, when I realize who it is, the God that spoke the universe into the creation, the creator God says, I can recreate in you everything that you need. And all of a sudden, I stop just being pulled along, but I literally reach up to him. And that's the second work of the spirit. That's an amazing place to be, especially in our recovery, because we stop being so self-reliant. We stop manipulating ourselves. We start asking God, God, change my very desires. Change the way I think, because, man, I, I, I'm getting lost. I'm lost here, you know? And God says, yes, yes, and yes. Again, he delights in our recovery. Um, you know, in, in the Corinthians, when it says that you are a new creation in, in Christ, that I literally can change your heart and give you a heart of flesh from this heart of stone. But we really are reaching for that. We've done, we've been wooed to God. I buy the fact that there is a God, and now I'm reaching for help. Um, what happens? I get a stronger desire, first of all, for the Word of God. If God is real, 
and I'm going to learn that by opening a book? Let me open that book. But I also, I, my dialogue with him is, is more real. My, my communication with him is more real. With the Holy Spirit, it gives me the ability to open up in a different way. When I'm struggling, like I, um, I got... Um, um, in financially, we never, Brad and I never have much. Um, we're both, yeah, I, I'm in ministry, he's a musician, um, but we have everything that we need, you know. But we just don't have, like, if you asked us how much cash do you have, we just don't have. And I got in trouble physically with um, um, some medical things, and I knew I needed to work out. So I needed to go and work out and, and, and make sure that even in the winter I had a place to, like, swim or do whatever to physically stay um, healthy. And so I said, I'm going to go join the YMCA. In our country, it's about $65 to $100 a month to join the Y. And I'm going to go join the Y. And Brad said, we don't have any money. And I said, I'll let God deal with that. And he said, by the time you get in the car and get to the Y? And I said, yes. I got in the car, drove there. I'm filling out the application. And I'm saying, God, come on. <laughs> I don't, pretty soon they're going to ask me for a check, and I don't have a check. And I fill in out the application. And as I get to the bottom and I'm ready to sign, it says on the very bottom, if you have cancer, this is free. And I thought, woohoo! <laughs> I have cancer! <laughs> and you know, I told you the other day, I have leukemia. So I said, I have cancer. Do, would you like the name of my doctor? Would you like all that kind of stuff? And we filled it out. It was free. And she said, you know, we have this beautiful art program that is also free if you have cancer. Remember, I said I love arts. So I got the, the um, Y membership free and the art program free. And I walked out and I said, God, I want to kiss you all over the face. How good are you to us? I mean, how much do you love us? All that kind of stuff. And so there's something that happens when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, when I literally rely on God as a recovery partner, that I, I start to see all of the little things that he's blessing me with. And if you haven't seen that yet, my daughter has pink elephants all over her wall. You know, and, and some of you have heard that story. God shows us in some just such fun, ridiculous ways. He comforts us when we're in pain. And you feel the comfort of God, like all of a sudden you feel almost his hand on you and says, you know what, I see your pain and I know what you're going through, let me comfort you. And I think that is all with the reliance on the Holy Spirit. There's no way you can just read and feel that, but it's very tangible. Um, there's a woman that says, don't let your feet hit the ground without asking for the infilling of the Holy Spirit because you can't do this on your own. C connect with other people and do all that kind of stuff, but first of all, connect with God and know that he wants to fill you up with his presence. Um, and it's an amazing thing. My lifestyle changes, activities changes. When, when, when all of a sudden God is leading you, the very things that used to turn you on, like especially for people that are real twisted, they will start to not turn you on. The very things that you are drawn to, the addictions, and it doesn't happen overnight, but you at, get daily connected with God at this level, and he will start to change your very heart. And, and like I can look back on who I was when I first stepped into recovery. I wish I had a before and after picture. It's not the same. I can look back on last year or five years ago and all that kind of stuff, and it's not the same because God says, I'll change your very desires. I'll show you things and teach you things, um, um, and you'll be amazed. But it'll be very real, and, and that's why I think is an amazing thing. Um, um, the infilling of the, the Spirit is necessary for the believer to walk victoriously in recovery, in our healing, and in Christ. There's, you know, if I decide that I'm going to stop something and I just white knuckle it, it's going to be no time um, that I'm going to relapse. So it's like if I decide that I'm going to literally say, God, who are you? And you've got to make that real, is I actually will have victories that are unbelievable. I have about, uh, man, 35 years clean. How ridiculous is that? And have I ever relapsed? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. One time my daughter got her tonsils taken out, right? And uh, she was older. And so the doctor said, this is going to hurt. She's going to be really sore. So he gave her some really good pain meds. And so... <laughs> So who laughed right now? So, so, so he gave her some really good pain meds. And I went to give my daughter one when she woke up. And she said, Mom, are you trying to give me drugs? 
I, she's been around addicts. I've worked with addicts in recovery. I speak at schools. I worked with this one guy that was a methamphetamine addict with diabetes, and by the time he died, he was blind. He had skin disease that was crazy. He had to take a, like a, a fishing um, a toolkit full of medications just to keep him alive, to keep his kidneys working and his liver working. And he literally, when he talked, he would talk about what the drugs have done to his body. He's blind, he can't see a thing. And, and, and his skin would literally like welt up and it almost like there was something underneath his skin. And especially little kids, they would be going like, oh, yuck, you know. And my daughter hung out with that guy. There was one time I remember him saying, he thought he was thinking to himself, he's from a, in a bunch of um, like junior high school kids and he's talking and he's thinking you know I think I'm gonna throw up right now <laughs> and he thought he was thinking it in his head he was saying it out loud the whole front row is like wait <laughs> you know wait but it was like my daughter knew those kind of guys so she's not gonna take anything I don't take drugs I couldn't get that kid to take an aspirin right and so I decided to take her pain meds and put them on the shelf just in case she wanted them later right for an addict what do you think I was really thinking I might not have consciously thought this, but I thought, you know what? By the end of the week, I'm taking all of those. I, the Holy Spirit said, flush them. The Holy Spirit prompted me to get rid of them. I did not. By the end of the week, I had taken just about every one of them for whatever reason. I think I have a really bad headache. Maybe it's brain cancer, you know? I need one of those pain meds. So anyhow, so I took all of them. I got them filled for the next probably two or three months telling them that it was for my daughter. And um, when I had to repent, I had to repent to my daughter and to, um, to my husband and literally tell my doctor, please put on my chart that I'm an addict, no, 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 no. So I had to really do a lot of work on that relapse. And one time I'm at church and my, I hear my daughter at potluck. You know, my mom stole my meds one time. <laughs> Oh, good. Thank you, hon. You know, so, um, but, you know, what's really interesting about God and the Holy Spirit is that it doesn't mean we'll never relapse all of that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean all that kind of stuff, but the more I rely on God, the more he will be the recovery partner. I heard him say, flush them. Um, I still have freedom of choice. All of that kind of stuff. But it's amazing to know that the God that created all things said, if you give me the opportunity, I will walk you through this. I will walk you right back into your own skin. Um, uh, what happens um, um, with the enemy or Satan? He resists this work fiercely because he knows in the moment that you actually get an understanding of the Spirit and the infilling of the Spirit, it breaks his power completely, right? He can lie to us about a lot of things unless we are living by the truth, Unless we're being led by the Spirit of God. But the enemy says, I want to distract you. I will lie to you. I will put whatever in your place, but I don't want you to get this. Because in the moment that you get this, you'll be free. Um, and so just know that it's that big of a deal. You know, when you spiritually start doing some studies on this, it's a huge deal to understand why did God say, I'd like to give you my spirit? Because he just feels like two is better than one. He feels, you know, why, why did he give it to you? Why does he do that? And, and if, you, if you literally start asking him that, it's because it empowers you to be free. It empowers you to heal. Um, and it's, it's a huge thing. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave that one. Uh, I'm going to go through that one. Living, um, as Jesus foretold the Holy Spirit's power for witnessing and all that kind of stuff. But we're talking about recovery right now. And, and we're literally looking at why does God empower us? Not only to, you know, there's a lot of stuff like when you step into ministry, a lot of people think they, they kind of don't call on God in this way until they're standing up and they want to do something for God or they want to be a pastor or they want to be whatever. But we can't even do basic recovery without um, the Holy Spirit. We can't do, you know, when someone says basic recovery, um, um, going from one a lifestyle to the next, uh, stepping out of an injury, stepping out of addiction, and we've, uh, we really can't even do that with the whole, without the Holy Spirit. We also definitely um, um, 
need the Holy Spirit for our ministry, that, but I'm, we're not going to be talking about that today. Um, for happiness, for joy, for praising God, for healing, all of that kind of stuff comes with the Holy Spirit. It's just absolutely crucial that you don't try to do recovery on your own. Um, admit you're powerless, give it over to God, let God um, fill you up. In the living in freedom... Um, has anybody, raise your hand if you've ever had an addiction of any kind and you felt like you were trapped. <sighs> trapped. I'm in bondage. You know, I, you know, I want to do what's right and I cannot. I want to do the right thing. I cannot. I open my mouth and I hear myself manipulating the people around me. What is up with that? And what's really interesting as you turn it over and literally say, God, I can't do it. And, 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 and biblically sense, it says don't lean on your own understanding. Don't try to figure this out on your own. Don't try to do this on your own. And, and, and to the point that we buy that... We believe that, and we start to turn it over, is you'll see changes happen. Um, it'll show you things that you like for me. I needed to know that I wanted to die, that my basic thing was that I, I, I didn't even want to be here. I needed to choose life. Probably more important than stop drugs is that I, I needed to make that choice. Every other choice um, was healing. Um, I need the guidance. Um, you know, in a lot of our recovery, we know that we can't stay here. I know that I've got to change but I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what it looks like. You know, I was on the streets for 10 years. My family are addicts. That's what I knew. And now I come into a normal place. When I first came into a church, I mean, it did look like I had two heads. People looked at me like, you know, um, I don't talk right. I don't look right. I don't dress right. Um, um, any of that kind of stuff. So I really do need to know that there's a God um, in heaven that can direct me, that can guide me. And I'm going to ask for that guidance. And I'm not going to have to stress that I don't know where I'm going. Um, you know, when you told me, when I was come off the street, I'm illiterate, I have teeth missing. Then Donna's husband, um, Donna, the one that, that let me do recovery at her house, her husband was a dentist. And he said to me, can I fix your teeth? And I started crying like a baby. I didn't have any money. I didn't have insurance, any of that kind of stuff. And he comes in and he x-rays. Um, but when you're an addict to the level that I was an addict, my whole face was rotted. My jawbone was infected. I mean, it wasn't just, it's just not you get an infection with your teeth or you have a few cavities. But he said, I'm sorry that I don't think I can do much. And I started crying. I'm 23 years old. What are you saying? And he said, man... Um, I, I don't think I can do much. And, and when I started crying, he said, I'll do whatever it takes. And he literally cut into my jawbone, scraped off the infection, packed my jaw with antibiotics and all that kind of stuff, and um, saved what he could save um, um, and fix what he could fix. I remember saying to him, can I watch it? Can I watch you do that? And he's like, let me just tell you what we're going to do. <laughs> And they literally, right underneath your lip, they cut. I mean, they, they literally cut things open. And I thought, you know what? I don't want to miss anything. What if it's God blessing me? I don't want to miss that. I want to watch it. And he said, well, all right. So he set up a mirror. <laughs> he said, all right. And when somebody cuts your face open, it, it you know, I, I was just about ready to throw up. It was terrible. <laughs> I felt myself turning pale. I said, you know, I think I'm good. But it was like there is a thing that if God would have showed me that day or even that week what he had planned for this day, what I would be doing today, what my family looks like, what my life looks like, what I do for a living, I would have been paralyzed. I couldn't have, I couldn't have stepped forward because I would have said, I'm not capable. You can't do that. But he didn't. He just said, trust me. I know the desires of your heart. But you have to trust me. You have to surrender stuff, especially that, the suicide stuff, especially depression and addiction and all that kind of stuff. But trust me, I'm not going to take you anywhere you wouldn't want to go. And I got a life. And when I laugh out loud, I can laugh out loud in my own skin. But I had no idea then where we were going. It was powerful. But through his spirit, through the trust that I put in him, is I, can, I have the right for the journey. But man, don't do the journey on your own. You can't do it on your own. Um, 
I'm going to pass over this, um, pass over this. Um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's really interesting because um, I remember thinking that, so I'm studying the Holy Spirit. I studied everything. And I love Psalms um, 23 when it says, anoint my head with oil. You know, and the oil is representative of the Holy Spirit. And anywhere in the Bible, it talks about oil and it talks about the Holy Spirit, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So I remember going into a Christian bookstore and I, I tried to get a lot of people to um, anoint me or baptize me or pray about this. And I was pretty fanatical. You should have seen, like, if you think I'm fanatical now, you should have seen when I was in this study and I'd just gotten the healing. I was like standing on the pews saying, man, we just got to get this, you know. But I went into a bookstore and I saw a little bottle of anointing oil and I remember saying maybe I should get that in case I find somebody to anoint me and it was $4.95 and I thought oh stop I'd like to buy it just in case and so I bought it and one time I'm going to Thailand and I'm going to Thailand, I have the anointing oil, I still haven't found anybody to actually pour it on me, you know, um, but I have the anointing oil, and um, I'm going to Thailand, and I was asked to go rescue kids that were sold into prostitution. The youngest prostitute I held was two years old. I mean, these are from very young um, um, boys and girls, every age, um, in um, three different cities in Thailand. And um, the Thai Mafia threatened to gut us and hang our intestines in the back of the club if we rescued these kids. Because they lose money, so they weren't really happy with what we were doing. And um, on the way, I was thinking that Brad had said because of the death threat that um, I couldn't take my daughter. <laughs> but um, so he said, you know, if you have to go, I get it. Um, but I'm scared for you, I'm scared for Jackie, and, and um, the other kids that I took, I took a, another teenager that would, uh, was raped and uh, suicidal, and she was just doing her healing. I had her mother sign a death release form to come with us, and so I'm getting ready to go, and I'm in the bathroom, and I still haven't gotten anointed, and, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm having some stress about that, and I said, God, and, and I said, you know, can I just anoint myself? <laughs> And so I anointed myself in the bathroom before I went to Thailand. But, you know, since then, Rojas, um, which is an incredible man of God, anointed me at a place called the General Conference. And, um, but at this point, what I was learning about the Holy Spirit is that there, it's a real thing. And symbolic, we, symbolically, we can pray and talk about it in a certain way, but it's a real thing. I don't have to be anywhere. I could sit there by the side of my bed and just sit on, get on my knees and say, God... Fill me up. Um, even my thinking is tormented. I can't do this without you. And every single day, start out with the same thing. Before I do anything, fill me up. Change my very desires. I need help. And if you shut your eyes right now and just say, um, God, would you, would you help me? What do you think he would say? What's the thing he would say? Absolutely. Thanks for asking. Yahoo. And so what's really crazy about that is the devil has kept us from that truth. God himself is waiting for us to ask. And he, he's delighted when we do. Um, um, just prior to Jesus leaving, um, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit. I mean, that was his promise to us. It's good that I go. Because when I go, I'll send you a helper, a counselor, a comforter. And, and don't read those words without, what does a helper mean? What does a counselor mean? What does a comforter mean? And do you think Jesus didn't know what he was saying? I will send you this. Um, Remember what we read the other day about um, um, the sandbank. So apart from divine power, genuine reform can, can be affected. Human barriers against the natural and cultivated tendencies are but a sandbank against the torrent. Not until the life of Christ becomes a vitalizing power, not until the Holy Spirit is asked for that is received, can we resist temptations from within and from without. It is so important to know that I can't do this. If a temptation comes and I'm an addict and I'm weak or I'm tired or I'm stressed, guess what? I'm going to be using. 
I'm putting pills on the shelf waiting for me to take them later. You know, it's just without the Holy Spirit, without God, without that, that help, helpmate, that helper, um, that I'm not going to be able to stand against some of these temptations. In Christ, staying connected, I actually have a power that's outside of myself. And that's, it's just huge to know. Um, um, Jesus himself prayed for the Spirit. That just, I, I just find comfort in that. Um, we need the Spirit, God's work um, um, to be carried forward in power. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It, it's not something that we kind of um, can use or not use. It's something that I need if I'm actually going to do recovery. Our children need it. Uh, there's a thing called Child Guidance. It's, it's just a book that um, it's amazing as far as if you're having young kids. But this author says that we should put our hands on our children and pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit for them every day before they go to school. It makes their life easier, she said. I didn't know that. But, I mean, that's pretty powerful. See, I mean, you know, don't, you know, ask for your kids. We urgently need this. We're trying to do things in our own strength, and we have an enemy that says, I know exactly how to trip you up. I know who you are. I know who your grandpa was. I literally know how to trip you up. And the only way to get around that kind of enemy is to say, God, help me. Can you protect me? Can you? Do you think he can? Yes. Pray for the Spirit. Prepare for the Spirit. Um, you know, just being able to say, I'm thirsty. I'm done being sick. I'm done with this craziness. And I don't even want to turn it over and do religious cra religion crazy. I want to heal. I want to be, I want to be ready. Receive what God um, sends you. You know? He's going to ask you to do some things. Do it. You know? Um, you know even a 12-step group has things that they ask you to do. You know, they try to get you to change crazy thinking or whatever. God will do the same thing with the Spirit. He'll, he'll say, raise your hand if even as I'm speaking, God is saying, you know, you've got to change this. I want you to look at this. You know, God, I mean, we don't even have to wait. Is that, that We know exactly um, kind of what God is doing. And the best we can do is say, I'm willing to receive it, and I'm willing to do what you ask. And he's not going to ask you to do something crazy like cut your nose off. I mean, he's going to really um, um, protect you. Um, Pentecost is available today. There is a Holy Spirit. There is healing today. There is a change that can happen today in your life. This is not just stuff um, um, that happened years ago or stuff that somebody else can write about. It's that like God says, I'm ready to change your life today. Um, I love the, the fact that there was a guy in the um, Bible that, that um, um, God just told him one day, I want you to get up and I want you to go um, stand here. You know, and it was kind of a thoroughfare. I know it wasn't like a gas station because they didn't have any. But the guy got up, stopped what he was doing. He went and stood there. Another guy drives by on a chariot, and he's studying Isaiah, right? He's studying the Bible. And so God tells this guy, I think it was Philip, right? So he tells Philip, go tell him what Isaiah means. So he gets in the chariot. They talk a bit, tell him what it means. The guy sees some water, and he says, hey, can I, can I be baptized? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They get out. They do a baptism. And then he's transported back to where he was. <sighs> Disappears and goes back. And I think, man, I'd like to be transported. <laughs> do you know what I mean? What if? You know, and I don't know at what level God is telling us to have faith. What level? Um, at the level where he speaks to us and he freely knows who we are, at the level where he wants to be our, our partner as far as our journey of recovery, at the level he wants to stand us up with our own voice and stepping out to help someone else, at the level where he transports us from place to place, what level? He says that, you know what, um, you will do incredible things. I was in Kenya one time working with... Um, um, kids that were um, mutilated and sold into marriage really early. And they're just amazing kids. But um, it was intense work. And one of the girls had malaria. She was 19 years old, and, and she was dying. They didn't have the money for gas to get her to the hospital. And it was, it was a simple recovery, but they didn't have the money to get her there. And so God, I just believe, says to me, go pray for her so I can heal her. 
And I thought, oh, shut up, <laughs> because that's crazy thinking. God, what are you asking, you know? And so I'm, I'm with my partners, and I said, you know, we should go pray because I think God wants to heal her. And they're saying, you know what? If she doesn't get healed, what if they just kill us, <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking that God just said. And some of my partners that I was with wouldn't go with me because we were so bold in what we were asking for. But we ended up going into a community. We ended up going into um, um, the kind of um, the area that they live. And she was so sick. Um, we prayed, and she got up. She got up. Everybody wanted to give us presents, beads and stuff, because you know, they make these beautiful beads in Kenya, the women do, and so they wanted to give us presents, the mom especially, and being able to say, what if, what if the Bible is true? What if God is true? And what if he delights in our recovery? And then what if he wants to use you for something? It's an amazing thing to not only feel healing in the presence of God, but for God to say, now are you done with your own stuff? Because I'd like you to say something, or pray for someone, or share your journey with someone. Because I want to bring healing from your pain into someone else's life. And it's all done through the Holy Spirit. And it's an amazing place to be. There's going to be a point in your life when the pastor says, what about your own pain? There's going to be a point in your life where your pain is dealt with somewhat, and you get to step out and actually help someone else in their own pain. You would do that because of God and because of the Holy Spirit. So if you're going to do recovery, don't do it alone. If you haven't given faith a chance, man, give God a chance. Everything you think you know about God you don't know. When he actually tells you a joke or holds you or blesses you with a life, changes your heart, um, it's amazing. It's an amazing thing. And so the, the last thing that I want to say and the last thing I actually want to talk about is everything that you have to know about addiction, all the research you're going to do, all the stuff you're going to surrender as you connect with each other, especially in groups or that kind of friendship with churches, that kind of stuff, that's all great. But don't do it without God. Don't do it without the Holy Spirit because that's where your strength is going to come from. And that's where your change is going to come from. And when you stand up with your voice, that's where your voice is going to come from. Anybody have any questions? Not only about tonight, about, about this entire presentation. Yes. It was, you know, what's really tough about learning to trust again is when I got some of that healing. So most of us, raise your hand if you've ever felt even a little healing from God. So when you feel that, that little thing, is that a part of me says, I wonder if he can be trustworthy. And so it's, it's almost like, and it's not a big leap that all of a sudden I can trust. It's those little tiny things. Um, even in, the, in, the, in um, the Old Testament, people said, write it down. When something happens and you get hope, when something happens and you actually feel maybe this is real, write it down because there's a time that you're going to need it. And so I think it was little by little. Um, um, in our recovery, um, ask for him. Baptize me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me up and teach me today how to trust. Can you say that? Just in your head. Teach me today how to trust. And we'll fight against that. We'll literally push it back from that. We'll, we'll think of every reason why we can't trust. Man, um, I can tell you days in my family and, the, and growing up in the house I grew up in, it was horrendous. But at, instead of thinking about that, I'm going to say today... Teach me to trust. Today, teach me to receive love. Now, a friend of mine bought a prison in California. I don't know why, but you can, um, they, they can be owned by private organizations or businesses. It's the number one industry in, that, um, in California. And so he bought a prison. And in the prison, um, um, he literally got a guy named Dr. Iacono from Loma Linda University, and he was doing research on the damage um, from, um, uh, from addictions to our brain, 
right? And so he said, you know what, instead of teaching them anger classes or how to do this or how to do this, let's literally um, teach them how to love or trust, right? And so how do you do that? The inmates came in, it's federal penitentiary, and they had a number on their shirt. Okay, first of all, let's get rid of the number. Let's put Mr. So-and-so, right? And the guards and everyone addresses them by their name. If the guard addresses them any other way, the guard can lose his job. This is Mr. So-and-so. And, and, his, and the guards, they're used to the old school. So what do they call us? We don't care what they call you. But you call them by their name. And so the whole thing is, is how do you teach somebody to receive respect, to receive love? And they said once they actually did that, these men started to trust. So it is a weird thing about trust. We think that we know how to do that. Ask God. Because the research in this prison was saying once they started teaching these men how to receive trust, they gave respect. They gave it back to the guards. They started to speak differently to each other, but they had to learn to receive it first. Trust is a huge thing. Love is a huge thing. The only one that can truly teach us how to do that is God. And so when you said, how did I do that? I believe that God graciously showed me how damaged I was. I was surprised at how much I couldn't trust. I was damaged at how much I couldn't allow you to love me. Even friendships, I didn't know how to let people even do that. And God said, let's start there. And it was just one thing led to another to another. Now I can let you love me. I can love my family and my children and myself and God and all that kind of stuff. But it, it, it's like my partner is a really good partner. You know, it's a good partner. He's brilliant. He, he knew the level of my damage and what I needed. Um,